Good afternoon, pre-calculus folks. Um, this week is going to be, for us, a, a week in which we don't really cross any new material, but we're going to use the week to kind of consolidate uh, all the topics that we talked about last week um, as an attempt to kind of wrap up the work that we've done in our Exponentials and Logs chapter. Um, and from there, uh, we'll do a little bit of trigonometry. We're going to recap a little bit of trigonometry later in the week this week. Uh, and then that will wrap up the sort of the, the third unit of our course. So let me just get a real quick agenda for those of you in the course this semester. Um, here's what's happening this week. Um, quizzes four through six are now available in Canvas. Uh, you should be able to see those. Those cover the C topics, so C1 through C6. All of our material on exponentials and logarithms is now available in quiz form uh, through Canvas. Uh, so you can work on those now. Uh, those are due on Sunday night at midnight, so you have the whole of this week uh, through the weekend uh, to be working on those. Uh, and so what I'll be using are class sessions for during the course of this week uh, is just working on some uh, problems that I hope will be helpful to you in solving the problems that are on the quiz. Um, so if you have, if you do encounter um, particular questions uh, that you have about quiz problems as well as uh, homework, so contribute web work questions, uh, feel free this week, if you have a particular web work problem that you're working on that's causing you a headache, um, drop it to me in an email and I'll try and get it in Wednesday's uh, problem session. Uh, so again, no new material this week, but we will be using this opportunity uh, to work on some problem solving. Uh, the quizzes on trigonometry are finally going to start coming. Uh, so I'll have quizzes T1 and T2. Those cover uh, topics T1 through T4. So all of our sort of unit circle and right triangle and tangent and inverse trigonometry. I'll have a couple of quizzes available for those starting on Wednesday. You'll have a week to work on those, maybe a week and a half uh, as well. We'll kind of see how things go. Um, so once we have worked through these topics, um, that will sort of um, give us the opportunity to wrap up that unit of our course, uh, after which we'll have hopefully the opportunity to do uh, get, get, get you some feedback on your work on those quizzes um, and then get to a, uh, an exam on those topics. Uh, so that's what's coming up. Uh, after we wrap all of that stuff up, uh, we have one more unit left in the course after this one. That'll be our unit on uh, polynomial and rational functions. Uh, so we'll get a chance to sink our teeth into that last topic, uh, and that's how we'll round out this semester. So what I have uh, on tap today are just a selection of uh, problems to work uh, that will hopefully do a couple of things. It'll get our heads back into the uh, material of this last chapter, uh, as well as just get us some more exposure to the problem solving methodology uh, in this chapter. Um, I do have some older videos that I also will share in our class playlist uh, from an earlier semester when I taught this course covering exponentials and logs, so a session like we're having today but from a previous semester just to kind of add some additional worked examples uh, into what's available for you to look at. Uh, of course these types of problems are very commonly solved out there on the, the internet. Uh, plenty of other creators on YouTube and Khan Academy and so forth. You can find plenty of examples of the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of working with exponential and logarithmic expressions and equations. Um, so what I wanted to do today was to prioritize some of the, what we might call the more conceptual or the higher order thinking uh, that's involved in this. So what I have are first a couple of sort of almost project flavored examples. Um, the first one is dealing with a fractal called the Cook Snowflake, uh, in which we'll take a look at what this fractal is and then how we can uh, describe some of this fractal's properties using exponential uh, functions. Uh, and then from there, we'll do a couple of examples that are sort of typical for uh, math classes thinking about exponential behavior. They're also very typical applications uh, that we see out in the sciences, thinking about how exponential behavior lends itself for us to talk about half-life problems and doubling time problems. Um, and then with whatever time that we have left, we'll also work a few purely mechanical examples of how to solve exponential equations. So equations that have a variable trapped up in the exponent, how do we untrap it uh, and then solve for it. Uh, and then a couple examples of simplifying expressions using the properties of logarithms. Again, because there's a lot of content about that out there on the internet elsewhere, uh, I feel like I want to put it on just a little bit lower priority for us to do today. But if we have some time at the end of today's session, we will look at some problems like that. So today I'm pulling 
uh, some of the problems that we'll be working on from a different source uh, than usual. Um, you know, typically that we use the uh, the textbook from uh, Matt Bulkins, the Active Prelude to Calculus, uh, as our source material. Um, for these uh, first couple of problems that we're going to work today, I'm going to be pulling from a different textbook. This is Kathy Yoshiwara's text called Modeling Functions and Graphs. Um, so she has some really nice project-based kind of uh, material in, in her book. So I'm going to be pulling some examples from this, beginning with this first example on the Cook Snowflake. So let's take a look at this, uh, how it works, what is it, and what can we do with it. So the Cook Snowflake is an example of a fractal. Uh, a fractal is a figure which uh, is, has this property called self-similarity, that if we zoom in on it, it looks exactly the same as before we zoomed in on it. Um, there's a ton of examples like this out in the world of mathematics and geometry and art. Uh, and the Cook Snowflake is just one such example. So here's how the Cook Snowflake works. Um, I'm going to go to a slightly different copy of it here, just so we can zoom in on it a little bit further. Just give me a second to zoom. So I also want to be able to draw in it, so there we go. All right, so here's the idea behind the Cook Snowflake. We start with an equilateral triangle, like this one behind my too large head right here. Okay? So equilateral triangle, same lengths on all three sides. Then we superimpose another equilateral triangle on top of it, um, just by rotating it by 180 degrees. So what, what we're really doing is thinking about the figure that's created if we look at just the outside of this polygon. So we started with something that had three sides, and now we're going to add these little points. We're going to trisect each one of these line segments that made up my original triangle, and then add a little equilateral triangle on top of it, so that now we have one, two, three, four sides where we used to have just one. right? Um, and then we continue that process. For each of the sides that we had left on this snowflake, we trisect it and add another little equilateral triangle point on top of that, and so forth and so forth. So the more that we do this, um, the more that it looks like we're increasing the perimeter. We're increasing the uh, the length of the line segments all taken together around the outside of this equilateral triangle. It also looks like we're increasing the area of this figure little by little as we keep going. The Cook snowflake itself is the process of continuing this process out to infinity. So if we could do this infinitely many times, we would get a fractal. It actually has that self-similarity property. That if we zoom in on it, we're going to get exactly the same figure after zooming that we had before zooming. So that's the setup. That's what the Cook Snowflake is. Um, and so in this problem, what we're being asked to think about are some of the geometric properties uh, of the Cook Snowflake and how those may or may not be related to exponential behavior. So the first thing we're going to think about, first thing that we're asked to do uh, in this project, uh, is to fill out this table right here. And this table is asking us for sort of three different columns. The first column is just simply what is the length of each one of the sides of my snowflake in stage n. So we started, let me zoom down here for a second. So we're given here in the original figure, the original equilateral triangle has sides of length 1. And so I'm just going to take the liberty of labeling that right here. So my original equilateral triangle is 1 on each side, like that. And so with that information, we should be able to figure out what are the lengths of the sides at each one of these stages, each one of these iterated stages of making the Cook snowflake. So this first column, S of n, what's the length of each one of the sides in this triangle at stage n? At stage 0, that's my equilateral triangle here in the beginning, the lengths of those sides are just 1. So then what happens to my sides at my first stage of division for this snowflake? Well, what have we done to make these sides? We've cut each one of the original sides in thirds. And so that means that this side here, which originally had a length of 1, is now going to be cut into a chunk with a length of 1 third. This chunk right here has a length of 1 third. That chunk right there has a length of 1 third. So if we're keeping score, this is a third, this is a third, and then this little segment in here is also a third. But that little segment in the middle here is no longer a part of the outside of my triangle. But since we've stacked an equilateral triangle on the top of it, that means that the other sides of that little equilateral triangle are also one third. So if we take a look at what we have here, I'm going to just draw this in different, slightly different color here so we can make sure to differentiate. We now have, where we used to have one side whose length was one third, now we have these four separate sides 
each of whose lengths are one third. So what is the length of each one of the sides uh, of my triangle at this stage? That's just one third. What's going to happen when we then subdivide each one of those? Well, we're going to trisect each one of these one-third length sides, and each one of these new sides is going to have a length of one-third times one-third, a third of a third. Well, what is a third of a third but one-ninth? One over three times one over three. And so that's the length of each one of the little segments that belongs on this stage two iteration of the Cook Snowflake. Just draw that in here as best I can, so one over nine. Um, and so that means that at stage two, the length of each side is one ninth. And then just extrapolating that out one more time, on stage three, we're going to subdivide those one ninths into thirds. And so we're going to get a third of a ninth. That little segment there is going to have a length of one ninth times one third or one twenty seventh. So now we've figured out twenty seventh. What is the length of each one of the sides of my Cook snowflake at the nth stage of iteration? <clears throat> so let's take this opportunity to just sort of pause for a second. I'm going to get my big head out of the way um, and ask the question that actually comes next. That question is, how do we write down an expression for s of n? In other words, what function exists that can directly relate the stage of iteration n, which is the numbers here in my first column, with the length of each side of my Cook snowflake at that stage. What is this function? First of all, how would we even know that that s of n function is exponential? We're talking about this topic in this chapter um, because there is exponential behavior at foot, right? Um, but how could we tell that? Remember our definition of what it meant for a function to be exponential when we first met these before spring break. The definition of an exponential function is it's one that consistently relates a change in the independent variable, which is explained by addition or subtraction, with a corresponding change in the dependent variable that can be expressed by multiplication or division. And in our example here, every time I increase the stage by one, the length of my sides in my Cook snowflake are being changed by multiplication by one third. Or if you like, we could have called it division by three. Or if you like, we could have called it uh, a decrease by 66.6667%. Whatever, there's a variety of different ways that we can communicate a, a change uh, that that comes to us uh, via multiplication or division. Um, a question from the audience uh, today asks, is it the case that all fractals have this exponential behavior? Um, which is an excellent question. Um, and I would say that the answer is usually yes. Um, it depends on the nature of the self-similarity uh, that we're talking about. Um, so this is a particular fractal that just because of the way that we constructed it, and we're already kind of seeing that happen in this data table, because of the way we constructed it, um, every time we took one side, we cut that side into thirds, and that very operation of cutting something into thirds cuts the length of that side, uh, multiplies the length of that side by one third, which is why we're seeing some exponential behavior here. Um, but most figures that have self-similarity have something like that going on. For example, uh, if I think in computer science uh, terms for a moment, um, how do I zoom in on a figure? Uh, one way of thinking about what it means to zoom in on something is to multiply all of the coordinates of its points by some factor, right? If I want to, if I want to get twice as close to something, all I have to do is multiply all of its x and y coordinates by two, and it brings it twice as close to my face, right? It's like a graph transformation. Um, and so, if I have a figure that looks exactly the same after I multiply it by two then it will again look exactly the same after I multiply by two again, which is multiplying by four, again, multiplying by eight, again, multiplying by 16. And so just because of the fact that that zooming is a multiplicative operation, we should expect to see that self-similar figures like fractals have behavior that we can describe with exponential functions, exponential growth, exponential decay, the way that we're setting ourselves up to here. So great question. Yes, wherever there are fractals, there is very often uh, exponential kinds of behavior. So we can convince ourselves that we have exponential behavior in this s of n function here. 
Um, because after all, every time I increase my independent variable by one, I'm increasing my dependent variable by multiplying it by one third. And so what that does is it casts one third as the base of my exponential function because it is the multiplicative factor that I'm changing the output by every time I change the input by exactly one. Right? Remember, that was a definition of base. Uh, base is the answer to the question, I'll sort of sketch it like this, right? That if in my x coordinate I'm adding one, then in my y coordinate I'm multiplying by something. And that something is what we call the base of this exponential function. And so our base has kind of fallen into our lap here in this example. Our base is one third. So the base is one third. We can also tell that the vertical intercept, that has also fallen into our lap here um, because the vertical intercept of any function is the output value when the input value is equal to zero. And here, when my input value is zero, my output value is one. And so my intercept, I can find already right there in my data, is equal to one. And so because, uh, because of that, uh, we, can tell, we can tell right away uh, without having to do any additional algebra. So this is kind of a, a nice example, right? Without having to do any additional algebra, we can just fill in the base and the intercept into my exponential template, y equals intercept times base to the x. Right? Except here, the role of y is being played by the output values of s of n. So I'm going to replace that y here with s of n. And I'm going to replace my x here with the variable that we're calling this independent variable column here. That's called n. So I'll replace x by n. And now we have the function model that we were looking for. s of n equals 1 times a third to the power n. So let me declutter this diagram just a little bit. And we'll keep that exponential function written down. OK, s of n equals 1 times 1 third to the power n. And just to be safe, I'm going to put that 1 third in parentheses. OK, um, let's fill out the rest of this table, uh, because the length of each side is not the only interesting exponential, exponentially changing quantity uh, that we can ask about when it comes to the Cook snowflake. Um, again, there is exponential behavior probably lurking all over the place uh, with this fractal. So let's take a look at the next quantity. The next quantity was, what is the number of sides that we have in the nth stage? So at the zeroth stage, we started with just this equilateral triangle. Uh, and so this equilateral triangle has, as all triangles have by definition, three sides. So the first observation in the n, capital N column, the number of sides column, is that we start, my snowflake, with three sides. Now how many sides do we have at stage one? Let's just go around the snowflake and we can count them all. Uh, let's see here. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I've got 12 sides at stage 2. Okay. At stage 3, what's going to happen? I don't know if I feel like counting all of them. Maybe let's just count the first uh, third of the sides. So from this point to that point, I'm going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 sides just to get me from this corner to that corner. But then I've got to do 16 more going that way, and then 16 more going this way. So 16 times 3, I end up with a total of 48 sides at stage 2. So let's make an educated prediction. Rather than trying to count all of the teeny tiny little sides that I don't even think that the resolution of my monitor is high enough to really get in there to count them accurately, let's use the exponential behavior that we're already seeing emerge here uh, as a way of answering this question. So first, let's again convince ourselves why we're looking at an exponential uh, function. Every time we increase the stage by one, every time we go from one stage of this Cook snowflake construction to the next, what is happening to the number of sides on the outside of my snowflake? Well, to answer that question, we just have to compare, for example, 12 and 3. But if we're looking at an exponential function, we want to compare them not by subtracting, not to think of that, for example, as an addition by 9, but instead to compare by division. 12 divided by 3, 48 divided by 12. 
when I make that kind of comparison, I indeed get the consistent behavior that I'm looking for in an exponential function. How is this changing? 12 divided by 3. It's being changed by multiplication by 4. And we see the same thing is true for the second stage to the third stage. 48 divided by 12 is also 4. So every time we increase the stage in my construction by 1, we increase the number of sides in my snowflake by a factor of 4. So at the end of the day, what would we expect stage three in my snowflake <coughs> to have? Well, we would expect it to have four times as many sides as we had in stage two. And in stage two, we had 48 sides. So we'll just multiply 48 multiplied by four. That gives me 192, if I have done my mental arithmetic correctly. 192, big number. Definitely would not have wanted to sit here while I counted all of those, even if I could see them well enough to count them. Um, so there is the, the growth that's happening here. Why does that make sense? Let's just think about that for a quick second, um, using the, the figures that we sort of already started with here. I don't know if I can zoom in far enough to, well, maybe I can, let's try it. So here is a uh, zoomed in view of what was going on. Notice what happened, even just going from the first stage to the second stage. We started with one line segment on this side of the triangle, but then we trisected it and put an equilateral triangle on top of it, and one side turned into one, two, three, four sides. So every time I sort of take one side out of the original snowflake, I'm putting back in four sides where every original one side was. And in that perspective, I hope it makes some sense why every time we go from one stage to the next of this construction, we are multiplying the total number of sides by a factor of four. So let's sort of take stock of, of where we're at here. Um, if I wanted to come up with a formula for capital N, the number of sides, we now again know what the base of that uh, exponential function is going to be. That base is going to be what am I multiplying my uh, output by every time I'm increasing my input by one? And here the answer is four. The base of that exponential function is going to be four. Um, and the intercept, the number that I had at stage zero, the number of sides, the intercept is three. And so my number of sides, capital N function, is gonna have a vertical intercept of uh, three, and it's gonna have a base of four. And so again, using my exponential function template, capital N of N is going to be 3 times 4 to the power N. One of the things I like about this exercise is it sort of gets us away from, uh, it gets us away from that sort of locked in mentality of thinking about every exponential function as being like this a equals p times e to the rt. Like a lot of algebra textbooks and pre-calculus textbooks have this sort of rigid template that every exponential function has the letter e in it, you know, the, the magic natural number e. Um, that's not the case. And in fact, having the natural number e in your exponential function can sometimes really obscure the exponential behavior that we're really most interested in that comes most naturally to us. Um, because for me, at least, I think it's a lot more illuminating to think about my exponential function using a base that I have a ready interpretation for and that I can understand why the base is that thing. Um, let me try and get back in here. Because in this example, say, right, I can contextualize the, the, the reason and the meaning why the base of this first exponential function was one third. Because every time we go from one stage to the next, we're cutting the length of each side in thirds. And same thing with the, the n function, the number of sides function. Every time we increase the stage by one, we're increasing by a factor of four the number of sides. Because every time we take one side out, we're replacing it with four sides where there was originally one. And so every time we're multiplying the number of sides by four. OK. Now let's see if we can use this information to come up with this third function which is being asked for here. It's the perimeter of the snowflake. The perimeter is nothing more than the length of sides that it takes to get us all the way around the outside edge, right? The total length. If I had to build this snowflake uh, out of fencing or something like that, how much fencing would it take me uh, to build this snowflake all the way around? Well, fortunately for us, we know how long each one of those sides is, and we know how many of those sides that there are. So what's the total perimeter? 
the total perimeter is going to be nothing more than the former times the latter. The total perimeter is just going to be, if I multiply these two together, I get the perimeter P of n. So I'm going to multiply that. 1 times 3 is going to, well, uh, let, me, let me slow the algebra down because I think there's some value in that. 1 times 1 third to the n times 3 times 4 to the power n. Okay. Now let's go in and do some simplification uh, on this if we can. So to do some simplifying on this, um, I'm just going to get my like factors together, my 1 times 3. These don't have an n in them, so I'm just going to combine them together to become just a 3. But then I also have 1 third to the n multiplied by 4 to the n. And so here is an opportunity for us. Why do we ever need to know properties of exponentials? Here is an opportunity for us to use those properties of exponentials to make this uh, a simpler expression, one that's going to be easier for us to understand what's really going on. So as usual, I'm going to use this opportunity to, uh, let's see, what do we have? 3 times 1 third to the power n. Oops, I need some parentheses. Sorry, I'm typing and I know you can't see it, but bear with me for a moment. Um, to the power n times 4 to the power n. Okay. All right, so here's my expression. And I want to, uh, I want to simplify this expression. So how would I go about simplifying this? Well, I can't bring this 3 inside these parentheses somehow. Right, because everything inside these parentheses is being raised to a power, and this 3 is not. According to the order of operations, this power applies only to the 1 third that's here, and doesn't apply to this 3. So we can't go trying to distribute or do anything funny uh, like that. All we can do is looking, look for things that are similar. And what I have here that are similar is I have that my 4 and my 1 third are both being raised to the same power, namely to the power of n. So what I can do is I can combine this power of n, I, I can pull, I can factor out that power of n, right? Let me undo that step and then redo it so you can see what's going on, right? 1 third to the power n multiplied by 4 to the power n is the same thing as 1 third times 4 multiplied, or uh, sorry, raised to the power n, right? Multiplication is an operation that exponen exponentiation does distribute over, right? If I were simplifying this expression, I could actually distribute this power of n to the 1 third and to the 4, right? That's legal because exponents do distribute over multiplication. And now that I only have one exponent, I could simplify just by multiplying my 4 times 1 third to get 4 thirds. And so here is a simplified version of this expression, 3 times 4 thirds to the n. And that, therefore, is a formula for the perimeter of the Cook snowflake at the nth stage of its construction. Whoops, I'm running off the screen a little bit here. Let me get that fixed for you. Great. OK, let's take a quick moment and just, um, well, I was, I was going to say, let's ask ourselves what this formula means. And then that's going to give us a clue to how to respond to part e. What is happening to the perimeter of the snowflake uh, as we get to a higher and higher stage of construction? So. Let's do that by contextualizing each of the parameters that are a part of this exponential equation. The intercept parameter that I've highlighted in purple, and then also the base parameter that I'm highlighting here in green. The intercept parameter, again, as with all uh, vertical intercepts of any function, this tells me the value of the output, and here the output is the perimeter, um, when the value of the input and the input is what stage is equal to 0. So what this is then telling me is what is the perimeter at the beginning of my construction, before I've done any sort of subdividing or any of that uh, the business of making it into a fractal. We started this construction with an equilateral triangle. And because we started with an equilateral triangle whose side lengths were 1, the original perimeter was equal to 1 plus 1 plus 1. Original perimeter was 3. We can check that. That's this equilateral triangle right there. Right? Um, OK, so that contextualizes my intercept parameter. What about the slope? What is this, sorry, the base? What is that 4 thirds telling me? Remember, as with any base, it tells me what's happening to the output value when the input value was increased by 1. 
right? It was this little picture. When the value of x, the input variable, so in this example, n, when n is increased by adding 1, the output value is increased by multiplying by my base. And here my base is 4 thirds. 4 thirds is about 1.333, right? Um, and so how we can interpret this is uh, at each successive stage, so each time the stage goes up by 1, goes up by 1, we can say that the perimeter is multiplied by 4 thirds. Or if we were writing this in the New York Times, what we would say is that the perimeter is increasing by 33%. 33.333%, 33.333%, right, dot, dot, dot. And so every time we go from one stage to the next stage, my perimeter is going up. It's increasing by 33.33%. So what the question is asking us, what is happening to this perimeter as n gets larger and larger? What is the ultimate fate of the perimeter? If every time we go from one stage to the next, the perimeter is increasing by 33.33%. Let's take this opportunity, we use this opportunity to get a graph. So I'll open up our grapher, as we are accustomed to doing here in Desmos. And let's just graph it. So p of x equals uh, 3 times 4 thirds to the power x. And so here it is. Here is my perimeter as a function of the stage in my Cook Snowflake. And what is happening as x goes out to infinity? Well, my number, my perimeter, the length of fencing it's going to take me to make my Cook Snowflake, is blowing up to infinity. Right? This is what exponential functions do. Whether uh, exponential growth, in which case my function blows up the output value blows up as x goes to positive infinity, or exponential decay, in which it blows up as x goes to negative infinity. Um, every exponential function does one of those or the other. And since this one is exponential growth, we are left with the inescapable conclusion here that as n gets larger and larger, what happens to the perimeter? The perimeter approaches infinity. it gets infinitely large. It grows without bound is the way that um, the Matt Bulkin's textbook is, is, is sort of training us to, to, to use those kinds of words. Um, so the perimeter of the Cook snowflake increases without bound as n gets larger and larger. Increases without bound. So I could not, even if I wanted to, uh, make the infinite Cook snowflake with a finite amount of fencing. Right? I couldn't actually build because the perimeter of the snowflake becomes infinite. But there's one more part to this problem. And the last part here says, what's happening to the area of this snowflake as we go from one stage to the next? Can we, uh, can we say something about the area? Now that we know that the perimeter is infinite, does the area become infinite also? Let's see what we can do. Uh, to make an educated estimate about this. Um, and I'm just going to pull out some geometry that maybe you haven't thought about since high school, so this is definitely not something I'm going to hold you to, um, but just to kind of make our, our lives a little bit simpler. Uh, I'll take a couple of shortcuts. So a formula that you might remember, and you might not, uh, you'll be forgiven for not remembering it, uh, for the area of an equilateral triangle is that the area of an equilateral triangle is equal to the length of one of its sides. So if I call that S, sorry, you can't see my drawing here. Let me put it somewhere where you can. The area is the length of one of its sides squared and then multiplied by the square root of 3. So this is a formula for the area of an equilateral triangle. And so my original triangle is 1 by 1 by 1. So the role of S here is being played by 1. And so the area here is going to be 1 squared times the square root of 3. or since 1 squared is just 1, the area of this is going to be square root of 3. What's going to happen to the area when I go over here? Well, my original triangle is still here, right? My original square root of 3 is still present as a sub-figure of my stage 1 Cook snowflake. So let me sort of box that off there. 
But now I also have these three new triangles, each of which has a side length of 1 third. So what are each of those triangles going to have for an area? It'll be 1 third squared, so 1 ninth times the square root of 3. So each one of these is going to have an area of 1 ninth times the square root of 3. But how many of those do I have? I end up having three of them. So the total amount of area that I'm going to get here, let me make some room for us to do some bookkeeping on this. Oops. I'm going to have a total of square root of 3, that's the area of this equilateral triangle here in the middle, plus 3 of these little triangles that total 1 third square root of 3. That's going to be the area of the stage 1 Cook snowflake. And so what you notice is that every time we go from one stage to the next, our original figure is still there. Right? My original triangle was still a part of the area of my new snowflake. We've just added some new area onto it. And the same thing is going to happen again when I go to stage 2. My original area is still going to be there, but now I'm going to be adding a bunch of little teeny triangles. Each one of these had a side length of 1 ninth. And so the area is going to be 1 ninth squared times the square root of 3. Or if you like, it's 1 over 81 times the square root of 3. 81 times the square root of 3. But how many of these teeny tiny little triangles do I have? I've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I've got 12 of them uh, that are sitting there around the outside. So I'm going to have 12 over 81 times the square root of 3. Additional area at stage 2. And I'm going to try to speed this up just a little bit. On my third stage over here, I'm going to get a bunch more of these little teeny triangles. But how many of them am I going to have? Let's see, I had three there, I had 12 there. Now I'm going to have 48 of these little triangles, each of which had a side length of 1 27th. Sorry, I'm writing off the screen once again. Let me fix that for you. There we go. Each of which had a side length of 1 over 27. And so the area, 1 over 27 squared times the square root of 3. Oh gosh, what's 1 over 27 squared? Then get out a calculator. 27 times 27 is 729. And so I'll get 48 over 729 times the square root of 3. And so on and so on. And so what we'd really be asking ourselves here um, is what would I get if I added up the square root of 3 plus a third times the square root of 3 plus 12 over 81 times the square root of 3 plus 48 over 729 times the square root of 3. By the way, um, we can kind of come up with a pattern that each of these summands in the sum here seem to be following. And if I came up with that pattern, we notice, first of all, that each of these terms has a square root of 3 in it. Right, so I can factor the square root of 3 out of everything. Um, the other thing that I notice is that the denominators of my fractions are all going up by a factor of, hmm, what's that going to be? Um, let's see. Well, from 81 to 729, that's a factor of 3, a uh, factor of 9, isn't it? And if I rewrote my original fraction of 1 third here, I kind of don't like 1 third there. Let me make that 1, uh, 3 over 9 instead of 1 over 3. Because now I see that same pattern of multiplication by 9 in the denominator. And I can also see in the numerators a consistent pattern of multiplication by 4. Multiplication by 4, multiplication by 4. Um, and so what am I going to get here if I factor out uh, my square root of 3? I'm going to end up with something that looks like 1, and that 1 is coming from my first term here, plus 3 over 9. plus 3 times 4 to the 1 over 9, plus 3 times 4 to the 2 over 9, um, and then 9 times 9 to the 1st times 9 to the 2nd, and so on. So what I'm going to get here is something that looks like 9 times 9 to the n, 3 times 4 to the n. Um, and, sorry, let me scoot this over just a little bit. 
So here's a preview of a notation that you'll use when you get to calculus. Um, what I want to do, and I'm writing off the screen one more time, I'll stop apologizing for that at some point. <laughs> um, for right now, let me just move my screen a little bit. When the math is too loud to contain on one screen, that's what we got right here. Um, so what I'm really doing is I'm trying to add up things that look like 3 times 4 to the n, those are the numerators of my fractions, and 9 times 9 to the n, those are the denominators, where n uh, is just the, uh, not the stage of my cooked snowflake, but actually one less than the stage of my snowflake. And so what I'm doing is adding them all up. This is going to look a little scary. We use this capital sigma to say add up. It's the sum notation. And I'm going to add them up for all of the n values that start at 1 and which go all the way out to infinity. Right? So I'm going to add up all of the 3 times 4 to the n's over 9 times 9 to the n's. Um, and if I want to, I can simplify this. I can take this 3 ninths, which is the same as 1 third. Right? I can bring that outside of my sum, just factor out that 1 third. I can take my power of n and bring it outside also. 4 ninths to the power n. And so what I'm really doing is I'm trying to add up the infinitely many powers of 4 ninths. 4 ninths plus 4 ninths to the second power plus 4 ninths to the third power plus 4 ninths to the fourth power, and so on, and so on, and so on. What this is called, this is called a geometric sum. In fact, uh, it even goes by a scarier name that you will grapple with more in your calculus class, a geometric series. A series is the result of summing up an infinite number of terms. Um, and it doesn't take uh, a lot of whiz-bang calculus. In fact, you don't really need calculus at all. Um, you can show that any time I'm adding up a geometric series whose ratio is less than 1 in absolute value, that it does add up to a finite number. Uh, in fact, when I do all of this adding up, I'm just going to spoil the answer. The number that I end up getting here for this sum is equal to 4 ninths divided by 5 ninths, which is otherwise known as 4 fifths. How did I get that? You can look up the formula for the sum of a geometric series uh, if you want to. It is one of the standard topics uh, that often gets talked about in a, uh, in a calculus class. Because adding up infinitely many things is kind of a big deal in calculus. And so what do I end up with here? I get the square root of 3 times, running off the screen one more time, let me just scoot over, the square root of 3 times 1 plus 1 third times 4 fifths. That's going to be 4 fifteenths. And so let's see, 15 plus 4, 19. 19 times the square root of 3 over 15. And so the area of the infinite Cook snowflake is 19 times the square root of 3 over 15. Why is that interesting? Because the perimeter, how much fence that it took to make the Cook snowflake, the infinite Cook snowflake, the perimeter was infinite. I can never build the Cook snowflake because I can't get enough string or enough fencing or whatever, right? But if I could, the amount of area that it would enclose is actually finite. Um, so that's one of the things that makes the Cook snowflake very interesting as a fractal. Uh, and coming back to the question from earlier from the audience, do we see exponential behavior a lot in fractals? Yes, we do. Um, and this is another thing, another phenomenon that we see often happening in fractals, is it's kind of common for a fractal to have an infinite perimeter and yet a finite area, or a three-dimensional fractal to have an infinite surface area and yet a finite volume. Um, another example of something that does this is called the Gabriel's horn figure in calculus, uh, which is like a trumpet-shaped object that has an infinite surface area but a finite volume. Uh, and so you know, if you think of it like a can of paint, um, no amount of paint that we could put into that can would be enough to paint the sides of the can. Um, so it's, it's really one of these sort of geometric paradoxes, uh, almost. And it's that infinite behavior in there that kind of makes it possible. Um, but at least in this example with a Cook snowflake, it's also the exponential behavior that allows us to, without any sort of calculus or uh, any of that kind of stuff, grapple with the end behavior and the basic properties of what's happening. 
So that was a really good sort of longer form project-based uh, example of exponential behavior. I want to pivot now uh, and do a couple of shorter form uh, examples that involve half-life and doubling time. So half-life and doubling time are these sort of classic uh, examples uh, that come up a lot in applications of exponential behavior because they're a really sort of quick back of the envelope way of quantifying uh, exponential behavior. Um, with all that's been in the news lately about the coronavirus uh, and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, we actually see these figures reported in the news uh, fairly, uh, fairly with some regularity. I know I've seen recently um, reports that say something like, well, it took you know, it took three weeks for the original number of, uh, well, actually, why don't we go back to the, the diagram, the graph, uh, the COVID-19 graph that we started our exponential uh, discussion with uh, a while back. Let me get a copy of that back up on the screen real quick. Because one of the things that I appreciated about this graph itself uh, was the way, oh, actually, it's not this version. I have to go find the, the version that I'm thinking of. Here. Um, let me go grab a copy of it off the web real quick. Um, I promise this is this is worth it. I'm not going to dwell too long um, on this example just because I don't I don't want to get lost in the uh, in the news today. But because this was such a, I found it to be a really useful. Uh, data visualization for thinking about uh, what's going on here. So this was from, uh, I believe it was from the Financial Times. Um, this is the graph of the number of confirmed coronavirus cases country by country. Um, and if you've been watching the news or if you've been reading the newspaper or Twitter or whatever, you've probably seen a lot of different versions of this graph uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. And so um, what I thought was really interesting about this graph, let me get my head out of the way, um, is that it shows these little dotted lines. Uh, let me actually I'm gonna put this full screen here so we can see the whole thing. Um, no, that didn't help. I guess I gotta do that thing here where I just drag it up. There we go. So one of the things that this visualization does that I really appreciate um, is it shows these little dotted lines on the graph paper, where along this dotted line, it says the number of cases would be doubling every day. Along this dotted line, doubling every two days, doubling every three days. Those are measurements of what in applications get called the doubling time. How much length of time does it take for my output quantity to double? Because for an exponential function, that quantity remains consistent as my input variable changes. And so on this graph from the Financial Times, they're showing those as dotted lines. If I had a number of cases that doubled every week, um, it looks like that's what was happening in Japan for the first 20 days of the pandemic in Japan. Um, that's because every time we increase by seven days in the horizontal direction, we would be increasing by a factor of two in the vertical direction. Again, additive change in the input variable correlating with multiplication change in the output variable. And so for an exponential function, that is the, that's the giveaway, right? That's what we mean by a function being uh, an exponential function. And so any exponential function, we should be able to come up with a consistent doubling time. How much increase in the input variable correlates to a multiplication by two in the output variable. And that would be for an exponential growth phenomenon. An exponential decay phenomenon would have the opposite. Instead of thinking about uh, multiplying by two as we increase the input variable, we might think about dividing by two as we increase the input variable and talk instead about half-life instead of doubling time. So let's look at a couple of applied examples uh, from this that can give us a flavor for how half-life and doubling time works. Again, these are the kinds of concepts that very often in a lot of textbooks um, get treated as just formulas in boxes, um, but I don't want us to think about them that way. I would rather for us to, uh, uh, to kind of get the conceptual feel uh, for how these things work. So these, again, are from Kathy Yoshiwara's uh, Functions, Modeling, and Graphs, great open educational resource textbook. So the first question asks, uh, the population of Sweden, if it grows at a 0.1% annual rate, so every year the population of Sweden increases by 0.1%. The question here is, how long is it going to take the population of Sweden to double? 
Well, that's the question. What's the doubling time for the population of Sweden? So let's figure out how to answer that. Um, and let's do it by coming up with a model. So if I let x be the number of years since, I'm just going to leave that hanging there for a second, uh, and let's, let's y be the population in millions, millions of Sweden people. Let's suppose that I set those as my, uh, as my variables here. Um, let's try and come up with a function model uh, for this exponential behavior that we're seeing here that models the phenomenon of growing at 0.1% annually. So let's set a reference point. Let's suppose, uh, let's suppose that the population of Sweden, well, let's, let's look ahead to the second part of the problem. Um, the population was 9 million people in 2005. Let's actually use that as my point of reference. So let's let x be the number of years since 2005 and y the number of millions of Swedish people. And what that's going to allow me to do is it allows me to come up with the sort of rudimentary uh, data table for this. I can have a single data point, x equals 0, and so x equals 0 would be the year 2005. And in the year 2005, the population was 9 million, so that's going to give me the data point 0, 9. And since x equals 0 at this point, I know that the y value that corresponds with that x will also be the intercept for my exponential function. And so I'm halfway to having a function equation model for this population. y equals 9, so my intercept, multiplied by some base that we still have to figure out raised to the power x. So there's the beginning of a function model. All I have to do now is figure out a base. Where am I going to get that from? Well, the base is going to convey for me a rate of growth. So how quickly is this output quantity changing uh, as my input quantity is changing? And so that information is given to us right here quantitatively. We know that the population is growing at a 0.1% annual growth rate. How do I increase a quantity by 0.1%? To increase a quantity by 0.1%, I just have to multiply that quantity by 100% plus that. Right? So growing at 0.1% means multiplying by 100.1%. Right? The 100 is there, so we keep the original amount that was there, and then we're adding an additional 0.1% on top of it. But 100.1% is otherwise known as, if I move this decimal place, 2 over to the left, 1.001. And so the base for my exponential function is 1.001. So I have a formula now, 1.001 to the power x. And now that I have a formula, I can use this formula to answer all kinds of other questions. In fact, both the question in part A here and the question in part B are two flavors of really the same kind of question. We're given an output value, and we're asked to figure out what's the input value. Right? In part B, the output quantity that's being asked for is evidently 10 million people. And so part B is asking for what x value is going to give me a y value of 10. But also, part A is asking for a doubling time. And since part A is asking for a doubling time, um, what we're really asking there is how many years is it going to take before my original population has doubled? To double something is to multiply it by 2. And so one way of thinking about this is it's an answer to the question, when is the population going to be 18 million people, given that it was 9 million people in the year 2005? So let's figure out how to answer uh, this question. And then that's going to have to be where we wrap things up for today. Um, again, if you want more examples of the nuts and bolts of what we're about to do, um, you can certainly find those uh, 
you know, elsewhere I'm going to post a couple more videos of, of the mechanics uh, into our playlist as well for you, um, but you can also find lots of examples out there on the interwebs uh, of the nuts and bolts of how to solve exponential equations. Um, but let's do these, let's take them one at a time. Um, let's start with part uh, A, where what we're asking for is when will my population have doubled? When will 9 million have turned into, excuse me, 18 million? So to do that, I'll just use 18 as my value for y. And so here I'll get 18 equals 9 times 1.001 .001 to the power x. And now all I have to do is solve this equation for x. So the first thing I'll do in solving this equation is I'll try and get that uh, that power, 1.001 to the power x, try to get that power by itself. So I'll divide both sides of this equation by 9. When I divide both sides of this equation by 9, I'll get 2 on the right-hand side, and on the, sorry, the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I'll get 1.001 to the power x. Okay, and now we're in a place where we have my variable x trapped up in the exponent. I need to somehow get it out of the exponent, bring it down to the base so we can figure out what its value is. Um, and this is where logarithms come in. This is the entire reason for being, the entire definition of a logarithm. Uh, remember from what we talked about uh, last week, that every exponential equation uh, can be rewritten as an equivalent logarithmic equation. Uh, and doing that rewriting uh, typically also gives us a clue as to how that uh, exponential or, or logarithmic equation can be solved. So in this example, uh, let's see, let's switch back over into this, right? Every exponential equation can be turned around into a logarithmic equation. When I reverse the roles of input and output, I reverse the roles of exponent and power, I exchange an exponential function for a logarithmic function that has the same base as my original exponential hat. So if I, uh, if for the role of b, if I make that 1.001, and for the role of x, uh, I guess that's still x, uh, and for the role of y, we'll make that 2, then 1.001 to the power x is equal to 2 can be rearranged into the logarithmic equation log of 2 with a base of 1.001 .001 is equal to x. So what do I mean um, by all of that? We'll just take and rearrange this equation. So flip-flop the exponent and the power so that what happens on the left-hand side is I get just plain x. And on the right-hand side, I get a logarithm with a base of 1.001. .001, and that logarithm is applied to the number 2. So that is a, an exact answer for this question. It's not very illuminating if I have to write about this in the New York Times, but technically speaking, right, mathematically speaking, this is the exact answer. It's the base 1.001 .001 logarithm of the number two. And if I want a more illuminating answer, I'll hit this with the change of base formula. This was this magic uh, formula that we talked about at the end of our last session on, on logarithms that just told me that the base a logarithm of any number b, and maybe I'll use b differently here, the base b logarithm of a number c, is just equal to the logarithm of c divided by the logarithm of b. And those logarithms can be taken in any base that we want to. That's the real magic of the change of base formula. And so any base that I want to, I can write this as the log of 2 divided by the log of 1.001. .001. Right. And so any base logarithm that I want to, I'll use that log on my calculator. I'll take the log of 2, and I'll divide it by the log of 1.001. .001. And I'll get um, and I'll get a number. And it looks like this is the number that my calculator gives me at the end of that, 693.5. <clears throat> approximately. And so that then would be how many years it would take Sweden's population to double at a 0.1% annual rate of growth. 
So a pretty long time. Uh, I hope that I have that right. Let me try doing this calculation one more time just to make sure that I didn't screw something up. It's the log of 2 divided by the log of 1.001. Yep, 693.5. So it takes a really long time in Sweden for the population to double. And so you can imagine what it would take to do part B. When will the population reach 10 million? We just have to redo this calculation with 10 in place of 18. So just to run through that real quickly, we'll have a 10 here instead of an 18. We'll still divide both sides by 9. And so we'll have 10 ninths here instead of 2. And so the log that we end up taking is still a log with a base of 1.001, .001, but it's now the log of 10 ninths instead of the log of 2. Okay. And so when I do that calculation, the log of 10 ninths divided by the log of 2, I'm going to get uh, log of 10 ninths divided by, oh no, sorry, it's the log of 10 ninths divided by the log of 1.001. .001. I screwed that up. Uh, log of 1.001. .001. Okay, 105.4 is what I would get for that one. 105.4 log of 10 ninths divided by log of 1.001. .001. And so the population of Sweden would take a little more than 100 years since 2005 uh, to reach a population of 10 million. So a 0.1% annual growth rate for a population turns out to be not that fast, right? Um, to go from 9 million to 10 million would take more than 100 years uh, at that annual growth rate. It would take 693 years for the population to double at that rate. Um, but this is a, a great sort of introductory example of how uh, we can use logarithms to solve exponential equations. Um, and that actually is going to do it uh, for us for today. Um, so again, if you're taking my course this semester, we have the quizzes on this material are now open. Hopefully today's quiz or today's um, uh, live class can help you with that first uh, few topics um, on the quizzes that are there. As we go into Wednesday of this week, you can look for the material on properties of logarithms to come back. So I'll help you with that stuff on Wednesday as well as get us back into the trigonometry space because uh, there'll be some trig quizzes available as we roll into Wednesday as well. I hope you're all still doing great uh, out there uh, and I'll see you in a couple of days.